learning crypto. Bitcoin ETFs is an example that we're legitimizing it. We're creating more safety. Well, let me ask you this. Will you do another ETF? How about an XRP ETF? I know you got Ether out there. I, we, How about XRP? Can we, you answer that? I can't. <laughs> we, How about XRP? Can we, you answer that? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want me to. I do. Well, I can't. <laughs> Good morning, Warriors. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of your favorite crypto news channel, Good Morning Crypto, where we bring you the most relevant and impactful crypto-related topics from a top crypto research team in the world. I'm your host, Abs, joined by several members of our 3T family this morning. We got Mario, also known as the Node Defender, joining us on this Thursday. Andrew, aka the Cash Flow King, is in the building, and we'll have Johnny Crypto joining us later in the episode, so I'm very excited for today's show. Today on Good Morning Crypto, we will be discussing new revelations between BlackRock and Ripple. With the announcement of an XRP ETF possibly coming soon, we're going to show you several videos that correspond to this very likely narrative in 2024. We're also going to be announcing how XLM has uh, announced that smart contracts are upgraded onto the network, enabling smart contracts that compete with Ethereum. XLM could have a massive price run in the next 24 months. And with the largest companies on the planet in the process of turning digital, we break down the details, showing our community how this next bull run is shaping up to be the greatest opportunity of our era. Our show is available on your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Music. And for those of you listening via podcast, our show is live on YouTube Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern at the 3 t Warrior Academy channel. So Mario, as you can tell, we got some exciting content prepared for today. But first of all, how are you feeling, my friend? And thanks for being here. I am feeling great. Good morning, Abs. Good morning, Andrew. And good morning, everyone listening now and in the future. Well, it might not be good morning by, by that time, but hope you're all doing amazing. I am excited today, excited for the show. And we do have some, some very cool stuff to talk about. Andrew, so everybody's been talking about Brad Garlinghouse's latest Bloomberg interview. We're going to show some Larry Fink and CNBC clips that also correspond to an XRP ETF. So I'm excited about that as well. How are you feeling this morning? And thank you for being here. Hey, good morning. Good evening. Yeah. Oh. I'm I'm not on mute anymore. Uh, this is Andrew from the Netherlands, 5 p.m. here. So uh, I'm always excited to be in the show. Always amazing the articles you find. You know, actually, I took a little bit of a break because of the of the smart investor program. I have so many demands, and the people are making so much profits that I said, you know, I, I take a break, and uh, and next time the the, the 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 agenda is open again to book uh, calls with me. But uh, today uh, I do it like this, but I'm always open to do the Good Morning Crypto Show. So I'm happy to be here. Mario Epps, fantastic. We appreciate you, Andrew. And just a little celebratory note here, Mario. We are 508 episodes into this show. So shout out to our every single one of our listeners. We wouldn't do this if there wasn't people listening. So thank you so much for being here, guys. And we got 272 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. We're going to start this thing off the same way we always do, by checking out the Good Morning Crypto Twitter account. That is at 3TGM Crypto on Twitter. Go smash that follow button for updates all throughout the day. When we look at some of our daily movers this morning, it is green bubbles across the board. And in particular, the altcoins are pumping this morning. We got GRT up 20%, HBAR is up 8%, GALA is 7.5%, and File Token up also about 12% on the day. When we look at our Merlin market update, we are sitting at $1.96 trillion in total market cap. Bitcoin is 51% dominance. Ethereum is about 18%. We've got Bitcoin sitting at 51500 Ethereum approaching three grand. Sitting at 29.80, we've got Solana trading at 105 and XRP trading at 54 cents this morning. Well, Mario, there's a lot of exciting stuff to, uh, that we're going to talk about in regards to American adoption and an XRP ETF being launched this fall. But let's start off with a little Bitcoin conversation because I wanted to show this channel we found last night when it comes to where Bitcoin could be headed over the next 12 months. According to the having now, <laughs> this price chart is telling us by April 22nd, Bitcoin could be 140 grand. Completely disagree. But what I do think could happen before the halving is a $50,000 Bitcoin with the two and a half X after that date. So what Mark Yusko and a lot of these firms have done is they figured out the data. And what the data says is that after this Bitcoin halving, the peak of the price chart will be two and a half X, whatever the price is for Bitcoin on the day of the halving. So if, if Bitcoin is $50,000 on the day of the halving, they would anticipate $175,000 Bitcoin at the peak of the market. Very, very uh, modest estimates there. And it's pretty exciting to hear the big players putting out those numbers. What do you think for Bitcoin? When we're going through the hopium, people are very, very excited right now. Are you as optimistic as everybody else in this market? Well, I'm, I'm definitely optimistic, 100%. I think that 
you know, we've the fact that the Bitcoin and the crypto market is is mimicking the previous cycles. That's what's getting me excited because I know that there's profit opportunity coming up. You know, where I mean, the people that have been investing in throughout the bear market, they're already heavily into into profit right now. But, you know, there's there's very promising days ahead of us. Now, when it comes to the price targets, that's the part that I'm a, I'm, I'm way more. Uh, I'm not so so high as would a lot of people think, like the 200 plus price targets, 175. I could see that happening, but for me personally, I'm a bit more conservative. I'm looking at about 130 to 150, maybe 160, uh, just based on based on some analysis that I've done and kind of my own thought process about on how. Bitcoin has performed over the previous cycles and how it's doing less gains every single time. And plus, I just I feel like I feel like Bitcoin in itself is becoming a more mature asset. So obviously that means less gro- less 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 uh, exponential growth. And obviously it's going to be less drop as well. So like we're not going to see this huge volatile moves to the upside and huge volatile moves to the downside. That's just my opinion. But I think 130 to 150 is probably going to be our top for the next bull run for Bitcoin. And I want our listeners to put this in the live chat. Put a one if you think Bitcoin reaches 175,000 or higher. Put a two if you think it reaches below that number during the peak of the bull run. And Andrew, before we get into our XRP content. You're on mute. Uh, so uh, I don't hear you anymore. Just take over, Andrew. He's having issues, okay. I think. I think he wanted to ask me something about uh, about Bitcoin. So so what is my perspective on Bitcoin? You know, I do not look at the halving moments and, and the price at the halving. What I look is at the tops. I am I'm a guy from the tops because if you want to buy something, you can only compare if it is cheap based on a recent top. So if we look at the, at the tops from history, every time from top till top, the, the, the amount of percentage that the top goes higher decreases. That's what Mario already said. So what do I expect from the last all-time high? That was uh, 60, uh, $68,000 or $69,000, somewhere around that. I expect the max a 2 till 3x. So 70 multiplied by a 3 is 210 at the max. So that means, actually, I'm already taking profits, you know? Because I was a very early adopter of um, of, of Bitcoin and, and Ethereum, and also teach my students how, how to do that to be early and also to lower your average price all the way down. And uh, so then we are already taking profits. And uh, actually, I'm going to buy a new car soon. So. <laughs> well, Andrew, we do have some really good content prepared when it comes to BlackRock and XRP, and that's what we're going to get into from this point forward, guys. But we got 353 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. There's a couple of clips that we're going to connect, and I want to start with this video once again from Larry Fink. This came out, I believe it was January 26th of 2024, which was only a month ago, but it feels like a year. Larry Fink discussing the possibility of a Ripple slash XRP ETF. I think the advent of Bitcoin ETFs is an example that we're legitimizing it. We're creating more safety. Well, let me ask you this. Will you do another ETF? How about an XRP ETF? I know you got e- Ether out there. Mm, I, we, How about XRP? Can we, you answer that? I can't. We, How about XRP? Can we, you answer that? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want me to. I do. Well, I- So, Mario, that was a clip that circulated on Twitter and YouTube for quite a while because Larry Fink, he didn't just say no. There was a lot to the laugh of Charlie Gasparino and the smirk that Larry gave back to him. But I would say, before I play the Brad Garlinghouse clip, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the possibility. BlackRock is currently 576 out of 577 approvals at the SEC. So out of 576 applications, 575 have already been approved. I think it's very likely if Ripple and BlackRock partnered here, it could get approved in the next 12 to 24 months, even if Gary Gensler's at the SEC. But while I'm gearing up this Brad Garlinghouse clip, what's your reaction to Larry Fink? Yeah, I thought that those comments were a little uh, intriguing. You know, I can't. And then, well, you don't want me to. You know, it gets me thinking, why wouldn't he want, you know, him to answer that? I don't know. I feel like there's still this kind of uh, animosity or or uh, weird, you know, weird energy or feelings when it comes to XRP. I don't know. Like, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I definitely think that XRP is, is lined up to be the next ETF or it could be the next ETF, especially given its uh, regulatory clarity now. So, I mean, it, if they skip it, then, you know, it's just another confirmation of an agenda potentially. But 
yeah, I thought that was interesting. We've seen uh, we've seen them, you know, take different stances on crypto. And, you know, at, at first they said that Bitcoin was used for nefarious activities and it's it's not it's not worth anything. And then now they've completely done a, a 180 and, and they're saying that Bitcoin has got value. And and now they're looking at it with completely different eyes. So it, nothing surprises me at this point. I did think that those comments that he made were a little intriguing. Like I, I'm wondering what he meant by what he said. You know, what I think here, what's happening here? This is all social sentiment. And what does it mean? Hyping up and hyping down. Mario said about the, the negative uh, uh, news we always had about Bitcoin for uh, for funny activities. Uh, now, now Bitcoin, there is an ETF. Um, but I think Larry Fink doesn't want to tell it because if he says there will be a, uh, an, an XRP ETF, what do you think the price will do? Go, goes immediately up. So I think they will wait for their moment. We already saw that when the when the lawsuit ended, you know, it was a spike of about 100% or, or even more. And then it came down again. So people are lining or, or actually are preparing themselves to take advantage of the sentiment. And so guys here, everybody who's listening and watching, keep in mind, it is all part of the game. Absolutely, guys. And we're going to play this Brad Garlinghouse clip. Let us know your reaction in the live chat as well. Here we go. We would welcome an XRP ETF then. We would certainly welcome it. And I think it's inevitable that there'll be, you know, multiple ETFs around different uh, tokens. I think you'll even see ETFs potentially around baskets that also, I think, further diversify that risk. Uh, are you in talk? So let's pause it before we get into the BlackRock content, Mario, because this is something me and Johnny have contemplated and debated for a long time. I think that we're going to see a basket of a, a separate basket of cryptocurrencies that is 30% Bitcoin, 20% Ethereum, and then a lot, 50% of these portfolios are going to be altcoins like Solana, Cardano, XRP, XLM, many, even, probably AVAX and Matic as well. So I think when those baskets hit the market, it's going to be a completely different game for altcoins. And let me show our listeners something really, really, really quickly. When you look at a lot of the altcoins in the market today, although the market is valued at $1.98 trillion, over a trillion is sitting in Bitcoin alone and another $350 billion is sitting in Ethereum. That tells me that about 1.35 of the 1.98 is, is not in altcoins. That means that a lot of these projects, when you scroll down to legitimate projects like Quant Network, I'm talking these low Algorand, VeChain, these projects are still in the top 100, top 40 here. But one of the things that's really interesting, they're only 1.5 billion in total market cap. These things could be 10, 12 billion dollar valuations just off liquidity moving through the crypto market, not even having real world utility enter the conversation. So we'll play the end of this clip. I just want to throw that in there. Here we go. With the largest issuers, particularly BlackRock, to get this done. Well, uh, I'm not going to comment on that. I know BlackRock has said some things publicly. Uh, you know, we think it makes sense for the XRP community overall. Uh, you know, Ripple obviously is a very important stakeholder in the XRP ecosystem, but we're not the only player. And like we, we've seen, I mean, before the SEC lawsuit, XRP was the second most valuable digital asset. I think because of the headwinds of that lawsuit, you know, we've now seen that largely abate. Uh, but the long-term view on these things is about, you know, how do you create utility and really solve real-world problems with these different digital assets? So. I'm going to give Mario the floor and then I'll give my response as well. Mario, what's your initial reaction? Yeah, I thought, well, I definitely felt like Brad had know something that he can't, he can't disclose. I mean, just the way he answered that question, it tells me that there's something that he knows or potentially could talk about or doesn't want to talk about. But um, I could totally see that happening, especially like the baskets. I mean, Grayscale's, Grayscale's got products. They've been, they've been having products that, that offer like a basket of, of different cryptocurrencies, like the large caps, and you have you have them in those funds that they offer. So it would totally make sense to see that come, uh, you know, to the forefront in the form of an ETF. Uh, I believe it's just a matter of time at this point. It's not so much a, an if anymore. Like we went through, um, you know, we went through a, a long period of time where crypto was seen as this magic internet money, as a lot of people called it. And, you know, it's only used by you know, the dorks on the internet or the the uh, criminals on, on the internet in order to get paid. And I think we're finally, we're finally going through, going past that. 
Bitcoin's ETF approval and the fact that uh, Larry Fink and all these different people, you know, big, important people and, and institutions are now voicing their opinion positively around crypto, uh, around Bitcoin. I believe that's changing the narrative and it's changing the narrative in a positive direction. And it's just a matter of time until it scatters throughout the different altcoins, because we know being in the space, talking about crypto every day here, we know that, as Brad said, you know, use cases, there's so many different cryptocurrencies or, or blockchain technologies that are tackling different use cases. They're tackling problems that exist either in our financial system, you know, green, when we talk about the green movement, you know, how to track. I mean, there's so many different use cases that come to blockchain. And so once that narrative starts to be spread by mainstream media and by these big investors, big institutions, then that's just going to be a matter of time until people change their mindset and start seeing crypto and blockchain for what it really is, that it's not just meme coins. It's not just scams. It is actually primarily use case and utility, and it is the future and the evolution of the internet because the internet, in my opinion, is evolving into blockchain, which is the internet of value. Agree with you, Mario. And I'm going to kick it over to Andrew for the next portion of this conversation. Andrew, we got 448 live listeners here. Show us some love, smash that like button and check this out. Coinbase is now advocating for an Ethereum ETF as they're warning of a concentration risk with the SEC. The reason that I'm highlighting this, Andrew, is because once we get an Ethereum ETF, it's almost a guarantee that the SEC won't have a good argument for not approving an XRP ETF, right? Everyone thinks Gary Gensler is going to come up with any excuse in the book to not approve this product. The minute we get companies like BlackRock endorsing Ripple and XRP, the game changes, not only at the SEC, but for the global markets when it comes to this currency. So do you think when they approve an Ethereum ETF, that's going to change the game for Ripple as well? <laughs> no, uh, you know, when they approve an, uh, an ETF for Ethereum, it will not only change the game for X XRP, it will change the, the game for the whole market. However, you know, it always will be step by step by step. And I'm sure that uh, all, although Gary Gensler is is all the time trying to to slow down the the the, the progress of ETFs, I'm sure. And in, in the in in the back back at the curtains, or how do you say that? Um, they they are also discussing this. I, I'm sure that that Larry Fink also discusses informally with Gary Gensler or some of the people around him, and they are. Uh, uh, saying, okay, is it a good time? Is it not a good time? Let's wait a little bit. Not too much positive news into the market because if Ethereum will be approved uh, uh, in this week and next week uh, XRP and the week after that Solana and the week after that uh, Apex and then a basket of it, you know, it would drive the market crazy. So, you know, I think they will also be be uh, you know be, be careful with. With, with introducing new ETFs, but that it will come, that Ethereum ETF will come, XRP ETF, it is inevitable. But I think step by step, and the, all the big players want to make the most money. So, and they also like to do it slowly that their IT systems can handle it. So, uh, yeah, th that's how, how it will go. I agree with you, Andrew. And let's listen to a Bloomberg analyst on CNBC talk about what an XRP ETF, sorry, what an Ethereum ETF would do for XRP. You're all clear. You can start trading on Thursday. How soon before you turn around and try to make other spot products for different crypto assets? You know, I think we're going to see a lot of filings come out for uh, Ethereum. I even think we might see something for Ripple, given uh, the recent progress. Uh, you notice that Grayscale just added Ripple to one of their trusts that's publicly traded. So it wouldn't surprise me if we saw Ripple or Ethereum spot ETFs out there. You're all clear. You can start trading on Thursday. And you heard it right there, Mario. And I think it's important to not only regurgitate these conversations, remind people this was only one month ago. January 9th, 2024 is brand new news, guys. This is four weeks old off the printing press or off the, off the news desk, as you would say. But what's your reaction to that? A Bloomberg analyst admitting once an Ethereum ETF is passed, there's really not a great argument for denying an XRP product. Well, as I think he was 100% incorrect with what he said, because we could get an XRP ETF, but not a Ripple ETF. We could get Ripple going public, but I think we need to like we need to first start getting all these people accustomed to what Ripple is and what XRP is and not call Ripple XRP because that was a long time ago. But I, I get what he's saying. I'm just playing jokes here. But I definitely think, look, uh, Andrew touched on something very important. It's slow and methodical. And look how long it took. Like we were having talks of Bitcoin ETF during 2021. We thought the Bitcoin ETF 
uh, being approved in 2021 was going to be the top of the market. And we ended up only getting a Bitcoin ETF 2024, January 2024. So it takes time. We're starting to get talks of the Ethereum. There's been applications for Ethereum. Obviously, BlackRock being now involved could be it, it's a different ball game. It could certainly accelerate the pace at which it gets approved. But I, I, if I was to take a guess, and again, I have no crystal ball, but if I was to take a guess, maybe end of this year, beginning of the next, for us to get an approval for an Ethereum ETF, if nothing changes. I mean, I mean, let's not forget this year, we've got a bunch of stuff happening economically. We've got elections in the US, which is always a big deal, change of government. So if I was to take a guess, yeah, beginning of next year, end of this one, possibly after the elections for something for Ethereum. But um, Andrew was spot on. It's slow and methodical, and it took a really long time for Bitcoin. It could certainly be faster this time around for, for Ethereum just because BlackRock is there. But. I agree with you, Mario, and we're going to play a clip right now discussing who educated Larry Fink on cryptocurrencies, Andrew, because when you hear these ties, it might not be shocking to our listeners, but to the rest of the crypto mu community, I'm going to give you a little glimpse into what's happening here. Robbie Michnik is the head of digital assets at BlackRock, and what we're looking at is his resume, which I pulled up from BlackRock's website right here. What does it say in the second line? He's a member of the Corp executive team, and Robbie is responsible for driving BlackRock's digital asset strategy. Right here, what was his previous time? BlackRock spent time as a CCPI investment board for the public markets and private investments at Ripple. So he's being educated by a former Ripple employee. And what we're going to do is we're going to listen to a brief clip from here from Anthony Scaramucci discussing how Larry Fink educated himself about Bitcoin thanks to Robbie Michnik. Now, there's a guy named Robbie Michnik at BlackRock. He's a young kid. He came into BlackRock with the idea of creating a Bitcoin ETF. He orange pilled Larry. And I'm going to give Larry a lot of credit because Larry actually did the homework. Larry did the reversal. Larry was on the road to Damascus and converted as a result of being steeped in understanding exactly what it was and why it will be an international store of value. And, and, and I got to tell you something, it takes a very smart leader to pridefully say that Bitcoin sucks and then 24 months later say, you know what, I've got this wrong. BlackRock needs to be a part of this and BlackRock needs awesome. to have a significant stake in it. So, all right, apply that exact same narrative to altcoins cash flow. And that's exactly what I think we're going through behind the scenes. When they heard about XRP from Robbie Michnik, if Larry Fink, if this is, if these stories are true and Larry Fink was just educating himself in 2021 about what Bitcoin really is, that first of all, that's shocking. But second of all, if he's learning it from Robbie Michnik, obviously that man understands the XRPL and just the power of blockchain in general and that the capabilities of crypto go far beyond a store of value. So Larry's getting his foot in the door with the Bitcoin product, but I think it's inevitable they're going to move into altcoin products as well because that's where they can make more income. What do you think? What, what, what I see happening, you know, and I, I totally agree with this uh, with, with this interview that, uh, that Larry Fink in, indeed educated himself or got him educated by this Robert uh, Michnik. And, and, and of course, uh, there, there were two years ago, there were not too many people that, that were uh, had clear ideas about crypto, only the, the Intimi and the, and, and the nerds. And so, but now it's, it's growing and growing and growing. And actually this week I was, I was coaching several people with, uh, about, uh, about investing in crypto and investing in stocks. And then there was one student of mine and she asked, why, why can't I buy crypto on a stock exchange? And I said, you know what? Good question. So I went in eToro and I thought, let's see if I can Bitcoin, can buy Bitcoin. Yes, I could buy it there. I could buy Ethereum. I could buy XRP. I could buy Solana. I could buy AVEX. I could many coins. I thought, what is happening here? So what you see, and people who really have some difficulties with wallets and, 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 and transferring money, you can also invest in crypto in a regulated stock exchange and go from there. So what does it mean? It means that also in the in the traditional financial market, at least at the stock exchange market, also there are people that start understanding it and start what they what they are doing. So I don't see many commercial information yet that that stock brokers you you can also uh, uh, trade crypto, but it is there already, and it also makes the threshold a lot lower for a lot of people to uh, yeah to to jump into the space. So. 
I think we are making steps. Also, Larry Fink is making steps, and uh, we are really on on a good path into the future for adoption of crypto. Mario, I want to get your thoughts on the Robbie Michnik connections as well. And we already got 503 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. And this is what we were trying to connect the dots with. Because prior to joining BlackRock, Robbie was a was on the board of investments for Ripple. And so he was working directly with Brad Garlinghouse, Chris Larson, some of the most prominent people in the crypto community. Right after he left Ripple, he was hired by BlackRock to lead their digital asset team. I think that's a worthy connection. But what's your initial reaction? Yeah, like Ripple has like this uh, track record of connections, like either at Ripple currently or used to work for Ripple. Like it's it's astonishing, like the 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 level of people that you know come across Ripple. But like the part of Larry Fink, you know, getting educated, I think that that's a crucial statement, you know, because anybody who is kind of anti crypto, in my opinion, or most people, I just believe that they haven't done they haven't made the effort to spend a little bit of time understanding what the technology is. Because if you take a little bit of time, you know, 30 minutes to really sit down and understand and read on what uh, the blockchain is and what the technology, the underlying technology is, I mean, you have to be able to see that it is the future in some way, shape or form and so at some capacity. It may not be at the capacity of what we see a lot of these cryptos right now, but, you know, it's a developing technology. So, you know, Larry Fink, you know, Robert Mitchick might have been the influence for Larry Fink. Um, maybe he wasn't. Maybe Larry Fink was just playing it all along when he was saying that, you know, Bitcoin was bad and that he doesn't uh, see any value in it. Maybe he was just playing dummy, just like he's playing dummy about XRP because I don't know who knows. Right. But I think that especially these veteran investors, of course, they're going to be more methodical and more, um, you know, they're not going to be as open to risky investments, right? They're going to want to play it more safe. But I do believe that at the same time, they they have people in their team that are advising them. They have people on the team that are experts, that are seeing trends, that are that are seeing the technologies, that understand the technology. So this could have been the influence, might, maybe not, but it's definitely a, a nice thing to see that Ripple connection there. Mario, you know what it reminds me of that book that uh, it's called, what is it called? Um, sorry, it's by Napoleon Hill, Andrew. You know what I'm talking about. The Think and Grow Rich. Grow Rich. That is an yeah. exact quote from Thinking Grow yeah. Rich, Andrew. So now that I butchered the line, I'm just going to kick it straight to you. <laughs> but what I wanted to point out about this Brad Garlinghouse interview is that he said, the executive said that it's inevitable there will be multiple ETFs around different tokens. Now we're focused on XRP, but I think this is going to happen more broadly. We've already seen companies like Citibank be willing to work with AVAX and, and build tokenized assets on top of Stellar. And we do have a Stellar article that I believe we should get into as well, because many people are here for this information. Stellar starts to phase out the rollout of the Sorbin Smart Contract Network. This is going to be a direct competitor to Ethereum. And if you want to just hear the important information, I'll skip to that part of the article before we go in depth. With Sorbin, Stellar is charting its own course, not jumping on prevailing narratives. It's not a layer two, and it's not using EVM. We want to ensure that this doesn't affect existing stakeholders. So we're taking a very progressive approach in opening up the floodgates. So that really, really caught my attention, Mario. The Stellar Development Foundation realized that having to coordinate the chain upgrade with validators to deploy a decentralized app like the AMM-based DEX wasn't an ideal strategy. So they're actually looking at ways to upgrade the network faster. And when these smart contracts come into effect, they're stating it's going to be easier to code on Stellar than it is to code on Ethereum with Solidity. So... All developers out there know what I'm talking about. But Andrew, what's your reaction to the smart contract news? We always focus on XRP potentially adding smart contracts. Well, XLM is actually in the process of doing that. I think, first of all, we must understand the difference between XRP and XLM. So XRP is really developed for international payments for institutions, central banks, and, and that, that kind of thing. Major, made major companies, made major institutions. XLM is actually a non, yeah, started as a non-profit organization and decentralized money for everybody. You know, they, they, they use fast and cheap money transfers for individuals. And once you do this for individuals, yeah, what, then it would be very convenient if you also implement smart contracts, for example, to approve a loan or to, 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 to buy something and, and, you know, that is convenient because the, 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 the speed of the money can be so fast. So, and for XRP, I think smart contracts with XRP is, is not as urgent needed as for XLM. So I think 
it's a very good addition for XLM, and it also yeah, uh, uh, make, makes clear that if you want to invest in these kind of technologies, invest in an XRP, but also do not invest, uh, uh, forget about XLM, because XLM really is, yeah, I would say a little bit the same starting point. However, yeah, they really serve another, another uh, potential group of people. And I think that's that, that's very good that they say, you know, uh, non-profit model uh, and decentralized for everybody, decentralized money for everybody, and also focus on uh, yeah on, on financial in inclusion also in third world countries. So I think they are doing a, a good job for the world. Mario, this is the biggest difference between what XRP and XLM are doing with their smart contracts. Right now, we're talking about XRP incorporating Ethereum virtual machine smart contracts on a side chain. XLM is adding smart contracts directly into the blockchain. You're going to be able to program on Stellar using XLM as a way to exchange value. This is a massive, massive update. And I think it's going to drive a lot of institutions to use this product. One of the things I wanted to point out is that it's officially bringing Stellar contracts to the mainnet. So this is a very, very big difference because all of the smart contracts that are programmed on Ethereum, we're talking about using those smart contracts to the advantage of other blockchains, whether it's AVAX or XRP. This is going to create an ecosystem within XLM where smart contracts have their own program ability, never needing to use a side chain and never needing to branch out from the main network. So big, big difference there, Mario. What's your initial reaction? So the market, the market will be the one that decides the winner. And what I mean by that is that like not only the best te technology wins, like we know that it's not always the best company that gets the biggest piece of the pie. And that's just the way things work. Now, it's no doubt that Ethereum uh, has a lot of competition and has a lot of competition that is way further ahead than they are, cheaper, faster, better, right? And Stellar is going in that direction. As far as Stellar, like I like to, I know a lot of people like to say that, you know, one's the big brother, the other one's the little brother, and they're not really competing with each other. I think they're competing more than most people realize uh, just because of the involvement of the founders, you know, the, the one, you know, the I forget his name now that left Ripple went to went to Stellar. Jed so, McCaleb. Jed McCaleb. Thank you, Ab. So I think they're competing more. And one of the examples, the reason why I think that is is uh, MoneyGram. MoneyGram, once the lawsuit was presented to Ripple, they dissolved that partnership. They went to work with Stellar. But now, like the XRPL is also a nonprofit at this point. So I think that now we're starting to see something happen, which is like the X, the Stellar is going one way, right? They're they're releasing the smart contracts while XRP is focusing on the AMM. They're going they're going kind of in a different direction. I still believe they're they're a competition, but that's a great thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I believe competition is amazingly good for for businesses. Um, I owned a business where there was four of the same biz, business types as me within the same block. And I still thrived. We all thrived. We're all surviving there. So I think competition is is extremely good for 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 business. And I'm excited to see where both Stellar and XRP kind of kind of go going forward. And I I have no doubt that this is most likely a laggard thing. Like we're seeing developments. We're seeing utility. We're seeing uh, growth within these ecosystems. The prices are not reflecting it because the attention is simply not there on the prices, but it's going to be a lagging effect and it's going to show up at some point. Cash, well, I'm going to kick it straight to you. But when we talk about the MoneyGram partnership, I find this to be very interesting. MoneyGram is going to be one of the first companies to probably incorporate smart contracts for money transfers on XLM, just because they're going to be involved in these conversations. They're on, they're openly uh, communicating with the Stellar Development Foundation as well. So it's only inevitable that if they if they allow smart contracts for on-demand liquidity, we are going to see Stellar begin to be leveraged by MoneyGram. So very, very exciting. It could be a huge catalyst for the price as well. What are some of your thoughts to what Mario had to say? Yeah, this is interesting to see, uh, especially about this uh, this competition, who is the best, who will win. We saw that also with the, with the, with the video disc and the Blu-ray disc and it's all gone and the... And the and, and the Betamax and the VHS video recorders for, for some of all the people with us. Um, I think if XLM is really able to, to open up for smaller developments with an uh, Ethereum virtual machine kind of application, and, and, and you get a lot of adoption of developers into your ecosystem, it can go pretty fast. 
And XLM did not have the, 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 the disadvantage that there was a lawsuit. So they continued go, going on and growing what X, XRP only had could do outside outside the US. So yeah, I think it's it's a pretty interesting uh, 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 race that is run. And you know who will win the race? Maybe a third, a third crypto will come in, in the near future. That will in, maybe maybe Solana will take over. You know we don't know, but at least here are very interesting developments, and it only increases the basis for the whole crypto ecosystem. And that's that's very good. Completely agree with you. And I want to point out the correlation between the XLM and XRP partnership that we're seeing right now. Look at the price charts. Mario, as they're overlaid on top of each other, David Schwartz actually tweeted this out. So it's very interesting. Since 2014, we've seen almost an exact correlation between when these projects move. Not only the historic bull run that we saw in 2017, but the price pump that happened in late 2020 all the way to early 2021 with both of these projects. Now, the return on investment seems similar. It does seem like XRP is slightly outpacing XLM if we want to get you know real specific here. But more broadly, it looks like these projects are connected in some way, shape, or form. And Andrew brought up the founder of XLM is Jed McCaleb. Jed McCaleb founded Ripple with David Schwartz, Chris Larson, Brad Garlinghouse. So very interesting narrative going on here. And we got 552 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button and let me know what you think in the live chat. Do you think XRP is going to outperform XLM or will XLM outperform XRP in this next bull run? Let me know in the live chat. But Mario, what do you think? Yeah, look, that correlation, that that the way that the price of both XRP and XLM uh, move, there's definitely a synch synchronicity. Like, I know we can compare a lot of other cryptos, and because of them being paired to Bitcoin, you know, whenever Bitcoin moves, they move. Whenever they go, Bitcoin goes down, so on and so forth. But I do remember specifically points in the bull run where XRP was moving, and then you would look at XLM, and XLM was also moving. So that's there's definitely this weird synchronicity. So like, as much as we can pinpoint like the fact that it's it's because of liquidity and because it's because of the market being connected to bitcoin like i don't know like i just don't see the same synchronicity between other cryptos so i mean maybe we'll find out one day the exact reason is why that's happening but uh maybe it's because of the connection between the two and how similar they are and and a lot of people who are invested in xrp are also invested in xlm and so whenever there's positive news for one it affects the other i'm not really sure maybe it's a combination of different factors but i do believe that it's not I do believe that it's not by by chance. I don't think it's because of, you know, the pairing with Bitcoin, which I know we can overlay its charts from other cryptos, like I mentioned, and it could be similar. But like you're showing right now, there's specific points where one moves. And I remember I remember specifically getting notifications about XRP going up and XLM going up. So, yeah, I agree with you, Mario. And this is a prime example of this, Andrew. We're not going to spend too much time because it's always we don't really know why this is happening. And even David Schwartz admits it could be the algorithms. It could be just the way that these projects are programmed with the market makers and the buyers. But look at what happened. Even in October of 2023, we got some news that BlackRock had potentially filed an XRP application in Utah or Wyoming, something along those lines. Well, what happened? The XRP price went from about 64 cents to 72 cents and back to $0.65, cents, all within just a couple of hours here, Andrew. Now, that's not shocking, right? Classic pump and dump on XRP. Here's what's shocking, is that XLM did the exact same thing with no correlation in the news whatsoever. XLM had the exact same percentage gain and drop, actually dropping a little bit below where it initially started. So what's your reaction to, to even David Schwartz acknowledging the correlation here? Yeah, uh, you know... I actually, I have no clue why this is so correlated with each other. But I think because, you know, it's all about sentiment, sentiment in the market. And because uh, XRP and XLM are called uh, bro brother and sister or, or, bro or brother and the, and, the, and the smaller brother, I think there is the correlation. And to me, as far as I can see now, the correlation is only based on sentiment and, and ideas of individual investors. It has nothing to do with developments. Uh, you know, we saw a big spike that was in, uh, which was actually the same spike in July uh, last year. But that was the end of the XRP lawsuit. And then you also saw XLM spiking up and going down again. So it's weird. It, it's really weird, you know. But if you have, uh, you know, I, I'm an investor. If you have an, an, an also an entry plan and an exit plan, 
you can make a lot of money on those small spikes all the time. And, and that, that's also what makes this, this market so fun. I agree with you, Andrew. And let's talk about Ripple use cases right now, because this is an employee for Ripple and his name is Brooks Etz. I cannot pronounce these guys' names. It's always so difficult, but let's not forget my name's Abdullah. So I think I do get a free pass on this one, guys. And we got 521 live listeners here. Show us some love, smash that like button and check out how Ripple's use cases could impact the price of XRP. Use case for our XRP ledger and XRP and built RippleNet, which is involved into a platform for cross-border payments with crypto native services on top. Think instant settlement, lines of credit, liquidity services. And we've been at this now for many years. We needed to build a use case first um, in order to really realize the dream uh, that we're very much living today as crypto has become uh, this new normal in finance. I truly believe we're at an inflection point. Uh, the reason this event has five epic days of lineup across multiple cities in Australia and with an outstanding group of speakers and a huge crowd uh, dialing in from all over the world, not just on the ground, is because of this point. We're at an inflection point and then some, and certainly, as I'll argue later, even more so in the region. The use case. Think about that, Mario. Pete, Ripple employees are now acknowledging we're at an inflection point for use cases on Ripple payments. Mic drop moment, floor is yours. Yeah, that ties exactly with what I was saying. Like the sentiment is changing. The more use cases that we see, like all these different crypto companies, not just Ripple, the, the more use cases we see these different blockchains start to roll out, the more we're going to get like clarity. People are going to st start to change their sentiment because there's, they'll be able to see, okay, so this is what you can actually do on the blockchain. This is something that is attainable. I believe investor mindset is going to change over time. And it's going to be a combination of that along with, obviously, we have the ETFs. As Andrew spoke about earlier, stock brokers or stock exchanges, adding the ability for you for you to also do crypto. I know in the U.S., one of the most uh, popular retail and also, you know, uh, has a little bit of controversy with it with Robinhood. You can also do crypto on there. So I think it's going to be a combination of things. But for us people that are here every day, they get like super excited. I think it's still important to also note that there's going to be there's going to be moments of of a lot of excitement and there's going to be moments where fear comes back into play where something happens or it's it, you know the economy takes a toll and then crypto goes down that doesn't mean the technology is going to go away it just means that we're going through a phase and we're going through a down phase so the technology like i've mentioned before i see it as the future of the internet it's the internet of value this is how value can enter the um, digital space and it, and it can enter it in a safe way. It can enter in a way where you have ownership. There's digital proof of ownership. I mean, there's just so many different use cases, gaming, uh, car, you know, carbon, carbon credits. I mean, the list goes on and on. But yeah, I think that the shift is is happening and, and it's going in a, in a direction which fortunately we've been able to see for quite a while. Mario, and I just wanted to point out some interesting information in regards to HBAR. HBAR is currently partnered with Hyundai to be their carbon emission tracking uh, blockchain. So they're going to store all of that data on HBAR. That's a massive company. Think about how many cars on the road are Hyundai's out there, probably like at least 10%. But we already got 535 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. Andrew Cashflow, floor is yours. And then we're going to get into some Bitcoin and XRP content. So what shall we say about uh, about HBAR? Or, or actually, let me tell you something. Um, I saw a new crypto coin i forgot about the name i think it is uh yeah I, I will figure it out i'll put it in the chat but that was ownership of your car data and what is it for example if you own a tesla the tesla is commun all the time communicating with the central server from from tesla and, and, and is uh, uh uh capturing all the data but actually it's your data because it's your car so now there is an initiative, a blockchain initiative, where you can uh, can get ownership of your own car data, and then you can sell it to 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 other uh, uh, yeah, companies that like to use it. So I think these kind of developments are also new developments in the in the crypto world that that we don't, do not have even idea about what are new applications. So the the the, the, the amount of creativity you see, and of course we also see carbon credits on the blockchain and, and other uh, and other uh, applications so we are really going into such a an, an amazing 
time period where, and I'm, and I'm still looking for and waiting for the killer application like we saw with uh, when the internet came with uh, with browsers and, and email. Email was really the the, the killer application, and uh, so I'm, I'm I'm and we saw that with also with the internet phase two, or the the, the second generation internet that was the yeah the, the 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 Facebooks on this world, and now yeah what will we what will we see as the killer really that everybody will use maybe in 10, 15 years? We don't know, but it's an exciting time. I think you're spot on, Andrew, and there's so many use cases. A bunch of these projects we talk about, there doesn't need to be one blockchain to dominate the world. If each one of these blockchains gets 2%, 5%, all of our listeners are going to have generational wealth. But let's get into this conversation right here because this is the warning that we got from the European Central Bank in regards to Bitcoin just last night. Bitcoin has failed to become a global decentralized digital currency, instead falling victim to fraud and manipulation. The recent approval of an ETF doesn't change the fact that Bitcoin is costly, slow, and inconvenient, argues the European Central Bank's blog here. Now, here's what's interesting. <laughs> they got corrected on a lot of their things, first of all, by Twitter notes, which is awesome. But here's what's interesting. There is another Ripple connection. The person who published this report for the ECB is stating that Bitcoin is costly, slow, and inconvenient. Well, they have ties to Ripple, and here's the tie that they have right here. CBDCs are driving towards digitalization, and this person helped Ripple construct this report for 2020 Ripple Swell event. So really interesting, Mario. Just the fact that, first of all, they're pointing out the flaws with Bitcoin, but second of all, that another Ripple, I guess, brain or partner here is involved in these conversations. So pretty cool. What are you, What's your reaction? Well, I, I, first of all, let me give a shout out to the people that do this kind of research, because I think it's amazing how they find these different connections. And so... That Yeah, it's like what I was saying before, like Ripple has all these different names either on their board or have passed through them and are now in different positions and have connections. Like if Ripple doesn't become this this sort of Amazon of the blockchain space or or, or digital payments or like, like I don't know, like it, we're, we're in some crazy matrix, but because they have all the, the right partners, they have all the right people involved. And so like I see them being as kind of this Amazon company of the blockchain space uh, as far as obviously the sector that they're focusing on but like that's kind of the the first the first reaction that i have to to that piece of news as far as what the european central bank said i mean look fraud manipulation i mean so is manipulation everything is subject to manipulation it's not a crypto problem that's a bad actor problem we're talking about like anything that Real money, like regular money, dollars can be manipulated. Dollars can, is is actually used way more for for illegal activities than than Bitcoin is. So again, the market is what what's going to dictate whether Bitcoin is really that store of value, is really that digital version of gold. The more people that look at Bitcoin, use it, like it, purchase it, get an ETF, whatever it is, that's how. That's how the the uh, the market will dictate whether Bitcoin is a winner or not. So far, we've seen Bitcoin just grow. It's been growing, it's been growing, it's been growing, and now it's getting massively adopted by institutions. So, whatever the central bank of of Europe is saying, eh, I, I take I take it with a grain of salt. All right, I completely agree, and everybody has their own incentives and own narratives here. But I wanted to play this clip so we could get your reaction in particular this morning, Mario. We're going to show our listeners the latest update from Charles Hoskinson, and no. Johnny is not here to defend him this morning, so I won't go too hard on my man over here. But we got 535 live listeners here. Show us some love and smash that like button. Enjoy this latest video from Charles. We'll discuss it. Said three times now. I never once said, never once said, never once said, three times now, never once said, four times now, that Ethgate didn't happen. I never said it. I said it doesn't matter. It's completely immaterial to the litigation that they're going through. And it's not productive to the litigation that they're going through. And the grand conspiracy statement was strictly about somebody bribing the Securities Exchange Commission to go after XRP and give Ethereum a free pass. It's entirely possible that somebody could have bribed the SEC directly or indirectly, who knows, um, to give a free pass to Ethereum. It is a huge leap of faith to go beyond that and say they also bribed them to go after XRP. It is a conspiracy and there's no evidence. So, Mario, obviously there is some evidence, but let's talk about some legitimate claims that Charles made. Do you think that 
Um, do you think that the, it is a leap for people to assume if they have bribed Ethereum to get a free pass that they would bribe somebody else to go after their main competitor? No, I, I mean, I don't think I don't think that's not not possible. I mean, of course it is like if if the agenda is for Ethereum to be the ultimate winner and we have we have this other competitor, right, especially with the backing or with Ripple being kind of its main player in the space and having all these different connections. And I mean, they're a tremendous competitor to Ethereum. So if the if the agenda is for Ethereum to be the winner or the ultimate blockchain and they feel threatened by XRP and Ripple, then I don't think it's not far fetched to think that they would specifically, you know, get the SEC to go after Ethereum now uh, XRP or Ripple. Now, I'm not saying that that's what happened, but, you know, as far as Charles's point, like I listened to what he said, I, I feel like he was more specific this time around. So it was better. I still don't think that, you know, his conversation is going to settle this uh, this argument or this uh, bad energy that's happening between him and the XRP community. But I think it was he was a little bit more specific. He was a little bit more concise. And I do agree with him that at the end of the day, arguing that Ethereum could be a security is not positive for the argument of XRP not being a security. And for that matter, for the entire crypto space not being a security. So that's a part of the video that I did agree with him. And and so but I don't the part where he says, you know, he doesn't see that there's no proof. OK, I don't know if there's proof or not, but I don't see that. I mean, I do see that as being possible. Mario, and here's some unbiased journalism for you. I think Charles makes a really great argument when he talks about you don't want uh, Ethereum to be a security if you're an XRP holder because that directly impacts us as well. So although I understand that he's incentivized to say that, there is a legitimate argument to being an XRP holder and understanding that Ethereum's probably not a security. Coinbase is making the case. Grayscale's making the case. Gary Gensler slowly getting ready to announce that as well. So what do you think about that? Before I kick it to Andrew up top, one of the things that just really stuck out to me was that is a legitimate argument that if you are an XRP holder, you just made it through a trial, you're not a security. If Ethereum also is considered not a security, that opens up the floodgates in the US for people to use XRP. What do you, you think? know? Yeah, you know what? Abs yes, that is a legitimate argument. But the part where I can hold or I can point the finger at Charles and not just Charles, like a lot of other communities or leaders of other communities too, it's when the SEC decided to come after Ripple. What did a lot of these people do? Like nothing, essentially. I mean, they either pointed and laughed and, and said, you know, Ripple deserves it. XRP deserves it. XRP community, the bankers coin, they deserve it. Right. But besides that, they did nothing. They were Most of them were actually kind of happy that Ripple was the chosen victim by the SEC. Right. Then they started to notice that this was becoming a trend of the SEC to go after other cryptos. And that's when they were like, oh, wait, this is an attack in, in the entire industry. Maybe we should get, come together. So like that part, that part I can hold against him because I, I feel like if he really wanted to show his support and if he really wanted to be kind of this good voice in the space, uh, he, he could have supported Ripple more or XRP more in the beginning. Uh, but, the, you know, the, I say this about him, but I could also say it about many other many other people in the space and even and even exchanges like there was there was only one exchange in the US that actually supported XRP, which was uphold. All the others delisted it simply by the fear and wanting to comply. And what did that give them? Nothing. It still gave them a lawsuit. It, SEC still went after them, still presented them with a lawsuit. So uphold stayed strong and kudos to them because, you know, XRP became uh, not a security in the end and they showed their support. So that's what I think a lot of these other people and institutions should have done. Andrew, what's your reaction to those statements? Because I do feel like there is validity to this. We're all in this battle right now to try to get regulation in the United States for crypto, whether it's Ethereum, Solana, XRP, we all need regulation. So that's some common ground. But what's your initial reaction to not only Charles Clip, but what Mario had to say? I, You know what I remember from about two, two and a half years ago when, when the lawsuit started against XRP. I know that actually what they say is Bitcoin was OK. Ethereum was okay and XRP was totally wrong. You know, that was bad. And, and so that is what you saw is the crypto exchanges, uh, they, they start selling XRP, uh, only Binance, you know, that, that also sold it, but it was outside the, outside the US. So I really see here a, uh, a, 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 yeah, maybe I think in conspiracies, but I know that a lot of banks and institutions and other uh, major, major major players 
were already investing in, in knowledge in Ethereum. So they thought, yeah, watch out. Uh, we can't have a competitor. So for me, it's clear that 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 XRP, XRP needed that they needed somebody to get the blame. And and even the, a guy like uh, uh, how was his name? Um, uh, that, that that guy before uh, G Gary Gensler, you know, he, he left the company the uh, the day after uh, after he uh, he started the lawsuit. For me, the whole case stinks. Yeah, and and I, I can't I really agree with you about it. Andrew, the person you're thinking of is Jay Clayton, and not only did he file this Jay lawsuit, Clayton, correct? Yeah. yeah, it's undeniable that he damaged the XRP community because we're we are looking at the data from November 2nd all the way to when the lawsuit was filed in mid-December. I believe it was filed on this week right here. So I held XRP at this time. I know Mario did. I think Andrew did. Mario, do you remember the price run of the hopium that was coming into the market? The sentiment of the XRP community, this was a totally different group. This was a pre-lawsuit group, a very optimistic group over here. And we went from 20 cents to about 75 cents in just a couple of weeks, only to figure out we were going to be sued by the SEC taking us all the way back down to that 17 and a half cent mark. And this wick actually goes as low as 16 and a half. So it's undeniable that there were damages not only to the XRP community, but to the XRPL ecosystem as a whole. And I think Brad acknowledged that in his Bloomberg interview. So what do you think? You know what was happening at around that exact same time too? It was the flare airdrop, right? The, the snapshot for the flare airdrop. So I remember a lot of people were actually yeah. getting their XRP situated in the wallets for the snapshot. And so like the lawsuit came, I think a couple of days before Christmas or like around Christmas time, yeah, yeah. like it was, it was horrendous. Like I know that there was a little bit of a heads up and some people were already exp uh, expecting it. Cause I know Brad, Brad Garlinghouse uh, did, did uh, say it publicly, but it completely flipped the sentiment. I mean, I, I had the blessing to be able to say to myself, you know what, this is actually, I see it as an opportunity. And a lot of that has to do with the Academy. I had just joined the Academy and I remember coach JV saying, I'm backing up the truck. I'm buying more. This is a huge opportunity. So shout out to coach JV for, you know, passing on that message and, and, and keeping us positive in a time when obviously you would have fought it out. you you know, generally you would have fought it out. You would have been like, screw this, you know, XRP is going to zero, fought out. But, you know, we stayed strong in the community and I'm really glad that we did. And hey, I'm Mario, really I can home. even tell you on Coinbase, when they started to, to, to ban XRP, you were only allowed to sell. Yeah, so, and transfer. So you, could, yep. you could withdraw, but you could not buy anymore. You were only allowed to sell. Now that, that's, that scared a lot of people. So they all start. I know a lot of people. They started selling. Oh, in 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 a while it will be it will be zero. Value will be zero. I need to sell now. So what happened? Price went down and down and more down because if you have only sellers and no buyers, yeah. So yeah, and then yeah, we bought more. <laughs> it's very self-explanatory too. When you look at the price chart, we're still trending in the right direction as well as. I know a lot of these projects are outperforming XRP, but anybody who's held this token for years, Mario knows. We move last during the cycle. So we're seeing nothing but normal movement from XRP here. And we got 522 live listeners here. If you're enjoying this show, show us some love and smash that like button. This was the user poll we asked our live chat today. Will an XRP ETF be launched in the United States during 2024? 65% of our 373 votes voted yes, Mario. 35% voted no. What's your initial reaction? Do you think yes, no? What's your thought? No, I'm going to have to say no. I think that I don't think it's going to happen this year. Again, we spoke about the logistics of how long this stuff takes. So I'm not going to get into it right now. But yeah, yep. I just think it's going to take a little bit more time for that to happen. Not this year. Andrew Cashflow, what's your thought? Uh, I actually was a little bit distracted about the Dymo. Dymo is on, on Coinbase, Mario said. The so question that we asked was, what do you think? Yes or no? XRP ETF in the USA during 2024. I, I, I voted yes. Yes. Yep. Awesome. And that's a, that's an optimistic way to end the show, guys. We got 515 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. A special thank you to Andrew Cashflow and Mario for today's episode. We love you guys. We'll see you in 23 hours. And like we always say, Warriors, ah, get the shit together, baby. Thank you for joining